and then with time they got bigger and more regularly shaped through mergers with other galaxies. So we'll be able to talk about you know just the very history evolution of our universe. Um, the other thing that I just want to say, I only have like a couple more slides, I'm just wrapping up, um, is we really don't know what we're going to learn until this field opens up. So, you know, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, the only kind of astronomy there was, was astronomy with our eyes, right? Like optical astronomy. And then astronomers started building telescopes at radio wavelengths, x-ray, gamma ray, infrared, and every time we open up a new wavelength, the galaxy looks different. So this is a galaxy called the Whirlpool Galaxy, observed with optical light, infrared, radio, ultraviolet, x-ray, and every different frequency, it looks a little bit different. Um, you all have an amazing 40 meter radio telescope that's being built right here in Chiang Mai. And it's going to reveal images that are, and, and insights that are very, very different from what you see with the optical telescope here. The same thing is going to happen with the gravitational wave spectrum. So right now we can only observe with LIGO these very high frequency gravitational waves. And soon we'll be out in here observing in a completely different part of the gravitational wave spectrum. And we're going to learn very, very different things. And there will probably be surprises. There will be new things in our data that we didn't even anticipate. And the idea in about you know, 10 years or so is we hope to make a map of the gravitational wave sky where we identify all of these supermassive monster black hole binaries. And we can observe them with our pulsar detector, but also with optical telescopes and radio telescopes and infrared telescopes. And we call this multi-messenger astronomy. We're observing objects with multiple messengers, both gravitational waves and light. Just a couple things I wanted to mention before I wrap up. One of them is that because we're I'm here in, in Thailand, you know, halfway around the globe, is that international collaboration is really, really important to our project. We work with scientists all around the globe to build these international data sets. And the reason that I haven't shown the international results, I've just shown the NAGRA results and the results from other pulsar time areas, is we're still working on this big international data set. Um, but that should contain a very high significance detection of these gravitational waves, which will be really, really exciting. Um, for those of you that are students, a really big part of being a scientist is working with people from other countries. Um, so it's really important to learn how to collaborate with people from other countries, um, communicate with people from other countries, and it's also really fun. We get to travel all over the world doing this science. One project we have is something um, funded in the United States, and we send students abroad to different observatories to work with colleagues in other countries. Um, we've sent a whole bunch of students abroad um, over the past uh, 15 years now. Um, for those of you who are high school students, um, high school students also play a really important role in our project, and what they're doing is helping us find new pulsars to add to this array. So we carry out a lot of searches of the radio sky to find new pulsars, and it's really hard work. It produces a lot of data, and we need help sifting through the data and figuring out like what's a pulsar and what's someone's cell phone signal or some other source of radio frequency interference. And high school students help us find these pulsars by learning how to analyze the data online. Um, you can participate in this if you're a high school student and you would like to help us, or, or an undergraduate student for that matter. Um, you can go to pulsars.magrav.org, you can sign up, you can take an online course, and you can learn how to help us find pulsars. And this is the number one way for us to get more sensitive to gravitational waves, is to increase the number of pulsars that we are timing. And I'm just going to play you a really short little video clip um, that just shows a couple students who have found a new pulsar and just how exciting it was for the students. Back to uh, when we were told we were going to telescope and we uh, set up there that we could see if the pulsar and it was, <laughs> it was, and that, that was really amazing and uh, up to like the moment, I was like, so yeah, it just might come up and it was like, you know, like, not there, you know, or, oh, I was far by there, you know, like, I was just wacky. Very interesting going you know.
So, there we go. Um, so I will end there. I love my email up there if anyone wants to get in touch with me and some websites. This is the website about the International Pulsar Hemingway Ray and our Magna Collaboration. This website, if you want to help us find pulsars. Thank you so much for listening, being such a good audience. Can you like define the location of the black hole by the data that you have collected? What a great question. Yes. So so right now I can't um, because all we're seeing in our data right now is this background, which has no direction. It's just background noise is everywhere. However, once we start to see single sources, then yes, we'll be able to tell where these black hole binaries are because the signature will be different depending on the angle between the pulsar and the black hole binary and the Earth. Um, so just like if you know about LIGO, um, these ground-based detectors, they can localize these in spirals because there's multiple detectors and so they can kind of like triangulate. We'll be able to do the same thing if we have multiple pulsars. Um, at first it won't be very good, <laughs> um, but with time it'll get better and, and better. We need, basically need to know the distance Pulsar is very well to do that. We don't know them quite well enough yet for it to be very good localization, but in another decades, uh, we'll be able to localize them quite precisely. Thank you. Where do we find those black holes? What a great question. So, so there are black holes everywhere. There are little tiny baby black holes. There are really huge giant black holes. Um, this other detector of LIGO has already found black holes that are the size of the sun. The black holes that we find are going to be everywhere in the universe. We think they're distributed throughout like the whole universe close to us and, and really, really far away. Um, we don't know exactly where they are though yet because we haven't found them yet. So. We need to keep searching, um, but we expect there to be a whole bunch of them, maybe maybe hundreds of them even, that we can find within the next few decades. It'll take a little while, but um, does that answer your question? Black holes are pretty cool, aren't they? Um, it is possible, it is possible that 
there are three galaxies that came together um, in what we call a merger. Um, I, I bet there is some galaxy out there with three black holes in it. Three, three. I mean, galaxies have lots of black holes, but three really massive black holes at the core. Our galaxy has like lots of black holes. It just has this one really big one in the center, but then there's lots of other black holes in the galaxy. But I bet there's some with three big ones at the center. Um, and we can detect those with our detector.